again to those to those that are joining us online and those that are joining us on site with Bruce and Kate um, for our on site viewing party. We're so glad you guys came to be a part of this discussion. This is a topic I'm really excited um, to be able to moderate and learn from some of our um, colleagues in the field that um, have experience clinically, um, some personally um, when it comes to process addiction. So um, our topic today, unhealthy behavior or addiction, the truth about process addictions. I am so excited um, for our panelists that have decided to um, be a part of this conversation and spend this next hour with us. At the end, we will have a few minutes um, for questions. So if you have any of those that pop up, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, also, again, just another reminder, please keep yourselves on mute so that we can hear our panelists speak. And if you would um, sign in in the chat, just put your name, um, you know, your email, any contact information you'd like to share with us, especially if you'd like to be added to one of our uh, newsletters, because we do those, we send those out um, both in a development and a business development capacity. So uh, be sure to drop your email in the chat for us. So I'm going to get started by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, um, we have Rachel Master. She is a registered dietitian. Um, Rachel is a registered dietitian nutritionist and eating disorder specialist. She has several years of direct experience working with clients in all levels of care, struggling with mental health, trauma, and eating disorder diagnosis. Rachel received her bachelor's degree in nutrition from the University of Arizona and completed her internship at Banner University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. She has a passion for helping individuals optimize their relationship with food and their bodies and considers herself a mental health advocate. Rachel enjoys her newest role as clinical liaison where she can help clients and families connect to quality care and ultimately find long-term recovery. Rachel, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, next, we have Lee Belcher. She is the executive director at BRC Healthcare. Lee has over two decades of leadership roles at nationally recognized behavioral health organizations. She is an experienced master's level clinician, trailblazer in the addiction industry, developing and implementing programs designed to address addiction and other comor comorbidities. She is trained in DBT, EMDR, trauma and grief. And Lee holds an undergraduate degree from Stanford University in human development and family studies and history and a master's in counseling from Georgia State University. When she is not working, Lee enjoys the outdoors, live music, a good book and spending time with Tula May, her three-year-old golden, golden doodle. Thanks, Lee, for being here. Next, we have Erin Watt, clinical outreach professional. Erin Watt, um, she currently works at Integrative Life Center, Integrative Life Network, as a clinical outreach professional. She is, ex is an, an experienced clinical consultant who is passionate about helping behavioral health professionals find the right level of care that best fits the needs of her clients. People know her as a fierce advocate for clients, their family system, and the referral team at home. She has a significant experience background with behavioral health in behavioral health industry, including roles as director of oper operations, trainer, program development, clinical outreach, utilization review, and quality assurance. Erin is, is also a certified life and relationship coach known for her empathetic yet direct style of working with clients, especially those wanting to improve attachment issues in their relationships. She has a strong science background with a master's degree focused on neurobiology of addiction from Vanderbilt University and a bachelor's degree in neuroscience and chemistry from Smith College. Welcome, Erin. Thank you for coming. All right, and Nancy Kirby, Director of Clinical Operations for Promises Behavioral Health. Dr. Kirby is a licensed psychologist and health service pro provider with 27 years of clinical and forensic experience. 
Her experience includes private practice, teaching, and oversight of various clinical and forensic programs. In her current role, she oversees all clinical services, including the program for sexual recovery. Dr. Kirby also has a variety of certifications in various trainings and assessments. Thank you, Dr. Kirby. I am so thrilled that you all are here with us today. And we're gonna jump right into some of the questions that we have. And I'll let you all take it from here. Uh, this first one is for Lee. Lee, um, tell us about what, what are process addictions? How are they different from substance abuse addictions? And could you give us examples of different types of process addictions? Absolutely. You know, a process addiction, I think we often think of addictions with substances, or at least the world at large does. And in fact, there's addictions to all type of things. Um, they're similar to a, a addiction um, with substances in the fact that you get high off of them. Um, in addition to you keep doing them despite consequences for your behavior. Um, for example, um, I may or may not have a shoe addiction and I laugh about it, but it's, it's true. I enjoy it. I know when I buy a good pair of shoes, I get a little high. I like the way it makes me feel right until I look at my checkbook, right? So therefore I can stop myself from going to buy the additional pair of shoes that I do not need because I don't like the consequences of that behavior. I think when we look at cross addictions, we look at the fact that they continue to use and participate and whatever the addiction is, despite consequences. Um, it's habitual, it's ongoing, it's the same similarity. It's very um, strong with substance abuse. Um, some of the common cross addictions, which you know most of you know, I'm sure, um, is gambling, sex and love addiction, internet addiction, exercise addiction, eating, um, shopping, working, porn, um, video games, cell phones. The oddest one that I've ever worked with was someone who was addicted to drinking copious amounts of water every day, like over a gallon of water, because it actually gave them a high. Uh, it helped with their uh, eating disorder also, and it was some self-injurious behavior. So it's just very interesting the different things that people can get so addicted to, despite the fact that her sodium level was always off, despite the fact that she had to go back and forth to the hospital. So definitely they can be different types of things. Thank you for that. So what I'm hearing is that the similarity is that it's that continued use despite the negative consequence with whatever it is that you know, you're using and abusing or using in excess. So thank you Absolutely. so much for that. Thank you. So Dr. Kirby, can you tell us what's happening in the brain um, when someone is um, active in a process addiction? Sure, um, similar, to, very similar to the substance use uh, process. Our brain gets addicted to the dopamine, the neurochemicals that we're releasing as we engage in the behavior uh, of choice. Um, our reward center gets activated, our motivation, uh, decreases because our frontal lobe, our neocortex, is not as actively engaged. Uh, amygdala and hippocampus are triggering memories of the relief we get. And of course, it doesn't take much to set this off in the way of a trigger. For many process addictions, it can be coping with stress, uh, past trauma. There can be a lot of different variables that come into play with the individual's need to either escape feelings or to try to do something to actually feel. Um, the brain receptors eventually become overwhelmed. We see tolerance. Uh, there's less dopamine because the body is trying to turn the receptors down, just like we would adjust the volume um, on a, an appliance that was, or you know, a music system that was too loud. Um, and, and as that happens, with process addictions, particularly with sex addiction, sex and love, what you'll see is not only, only an increase in uh, frequency and intensity, but also a marked increase in the novelty of the stimuli required, which becomes uh, more problematic over time. 
Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, how does that, given, a, given an example of how does that manifest or seen, um, you know, we see progression of tolerance with, with substances. Um, how is that gauged clinically um, with something like sex and love addiction or one of these other process addictions? How sure, with sex, with sex and love. So a person starts um, using pornography for stimulation, they masturbate. Over time, they may increase frequency, but eventually the frequency is not enough. And so they'll start exploring or checking out things that are a little off of, of the beaten track, so to speak more novel, more excitement, uh, potentially more dangerous involved. Um, this is where we get very close to people, may cross some lines with regard to um, legal limitations such as viewing child pornography. Thank you for that. That's that's a good example. Because um, like I said, we see a lot um, and it's e you know easy when you work in substance use um, to see that progression in alcoholism or a tolerance in alcoholism. So thank you for that example. Um, all right, so Erin, you started your career as a molecular neuroscientist. Um, what made you move from that to the field of behavioral health? Well, how much time do you have? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I think the short answer is that um, you know, I'm somebody who both is here as a professional and as an individual in recovery, long-term recovery from multiple process cross addictions. And I would say that when I started my healing journey, um, one of the things I recognized early on is because my childhood was so out of control, I sought a higher power that felt safe and science and academia was that for me. Um, I happen to have been born with one of my mentors calls it my big, beautiful brain. So I happen to have been born with this skill set. And so I applied that to an extreme and became what I think is one of the higher level types of scientists. I was working at, you know, very, very intricate. I was looking at the intracellular cascades of different dopamine receptors. So, um, you know, not coffee uh, table stuff. Right. But what I found being at that level of science was that um, we really don't know <laughs> most things and the things that seem to actually be helping me personally and the people that I knew in recovery had nothing to do with the phosphorylation level of, you know, an intracellular messenger. So while I honor and respect that type of research. Um, it, it became harder and harder for me to do that type of research because the industry is, is also not very supportive of um, taking care of yourself. So it felt like this contradiction that here I was studying an addictive process, looking for solutions that were microscopic and smaller, um, but the people around me were living in a way that was addictive in itself. And it just felt like a contradiction that I couldn't live with anymore. And I also realized that um, it was really my surviving my childhood that turned me into a scientist, that my natural skill set was much more relational, much more empathetic, much, much more emotionally intelligent than what I was able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that's my short answer. <laughs> and I hope that that's what you're looking for, but it's been an interesting journey. And so what does that look like for you now, getting to work um, in that more empathetic space where you're supporting others? Um, you know, that is such a radical shift. So what does that look for you look like for you now and and um, and carrying your knowledge, but then also your your personal recovery um, into this field, supporting others? Yeah, well, I think that's the first time I've said phosphorylation in like seven years. So I honestly don't use a lot of that information, but I do know that when I am speaking to a family or I'm speaking to someone in my private practice or I'm speaking to somebody who is entering a treatment center, um, I, can say, I can share my journey and also speak to a lot like, you know, what so far other panelists have spoken to. I can say, hey, listen, I've studied the brain and this stuff is real. You know, we see changes in neurochemistry um, that are connected to these, these behaviors. And, um, 
you know, I think that that helps lessen the shame when people understand that there is a biological, there's something that, that we can see, something that we can measure, and it's not just they're morally flawed. Um, so yeah, sometimes I bring that into my work and, and I would say that mostly though, I had to kind of abandon that approach in order to really meet people where they're at and help them. So it, it does seem like sometimes people think they're going to get neuroscience from me, but you know, that's, that's really not what I find helps people. I love that. And I, I love how you touched on um, shame reduction. And that's so, I think such a, a beautiful part of um, supporting someone in any recovery journey is, um, is meeting them with compassion and helping them understand um, the reduction of shame is so important. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that, Erin. Um, Rachel, okay. One addiction that we hear about a lot is overeating or um, addiction to food. Can you tell us about what you see in the field as a dietitian in your experience? Yeah, so um, the topic of food addiction is kind of controversial. Um, so I'll kind of just speak to my professional opinion about this. But um, so food is necessary for life, you know, on, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's at the very base of the pyramid, along with breathing, sleep, and water. So if we kind of interchange any of those and ask the same question, you know, how might you answer it? can I be addicted to breathing? Well, no, I really like breathing. It keeps me alive, but I suppose if you deprived me of it or deprived me of oxygen, I would probably panic. I would probably obsess about when I'm gonna get enough oxygen and probably won't be able to focus on anything else. It'll affect other areas of my life. And same with sleep. We don't normally think about it, but if we suffer from insomnia, we, we probably get anxious about that. You know, So something very basic has then become kind of complicated and is causing other areas of our life to suffer. So that's the same with food, but with food, media and society has inserted themselves into this and has given us all these messages that are very confusing. And it makes us question, like, what should I be doing with food? And it, it gets away from that very basic need. Um, and kind of like Lee's example with the water, like someone drinking a ton and ton of water, you know, that basic need has become, there's a behavior around that. So we're also the same species as we were as cave people. Um, so, you know, when we eat foods like carbohydrates and fats, we, we release serotonin and dopamine. That's our reward system for our cave person brain for getting food, you know, and we can kind of subconsciously catch on to that. You know, if we, I'm sure plenty of us have had a bad day and we go get ice cream, it makes us, it makes us feel better temporarily, but that's not necessarily a problem unless that becomes your only way of coping with things going on in your life and emotions, you know? So, so it's not the food itself that's, that is addictive, I would say, but it's the behaviors around it. And oftentimes we see with binge eating disorder that people are utilizing food to, stuff those feelings or to numb themselves or to distract themselves, dissociate. Um, and that behavior is, is what the issue is. And I know you asked about overeating, but I also want to address undereating as well and food restriction because similar to kind of emotionally overeating or binge eating, food restriction can also serve us in those ways as well um, as a form to dis of distraction or um, as a way to disconnect. And you oftentimes hear people who restrict their food intake, like I couldn't control anything else. So I, I controlled my food, you know? And so again, it's not about food, but it's the behavior. It's what, how else it's serving the person. Um, and that not, might not necessarily be just like anorexia or nervosa. That might be the average, you know, everyday dieter. So if you think about, you know, most people listening have probably been on at least one diet and, you know, those first couple of days we feel really motivated, we feel in control, we feel, um, you know, we just feel really good about ourselves and then a couple of days go by and a week or maybe a week goes by and we slip up or we eat something we weren't supposed to or we, we were really hungry and we overate on something, you know, and then there's this guilt 
which sometimes leads to just going off the wagon, you know, and completely overindulging. And then we want to come back to the diet or start a new diet. And so that behavior, that dieting kind of ritual, I think can be a process addiction as well. Um, and it can affect other areas of your life, going out to eat with other people, having anxiety about certain food situations, you know? So um, the behaviors around food can definitely, I think, be considered a process addiction. Um, but yeah, so I guess bottom line is I don't think food itself can be addictive. We have a physiological and a psychological need for food. That's a natural, natural thing for us. Hunger is a natural signal from the body. But when food becomes a way to cope with other things and we're abusing it in some way or it becomes the only way to cope, then that is where the problem lies. Yeah, thank you. you. You answered one of my questions I was going to kind of tag on to about that about, around control. Is it just, you know, um, like a sense of control or wanting something that, um, you know, if, if everything else in your life is feeling unstable, um, is that part of that? Um, what would you say um, are a few like, what, what would be some warning signs for people that may be out there that, you know, um, are curious, like what is like versus a diet versus the morning signs of, oh, I may have, you know, some of these um, behaviors um, for anorexia or binging or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, our relationship with food is like the most intimate relationship that we have. So sometimes, uh, most of the time we aren't, we might not see what other people are dealing with, with food, you know, and so, you know, definitely similar to addiction to substances, like isolation can sometimes mean, you know, something's going on, people that, you know, don't want to eat with other people. Um, it's, but it's, it's hard to tell sometimes. I think, especially, like I said, with our society now, where it's so common to talk about dieting and so common to talk about how much we hate our bodies, that it's hard to differentiate, like, what is, like us being normal, normal, which I don't think we should engage in that, but anyways, um, and what is some, who is dealing with something bigger than, you know, an average dieter, you know, so it's hard to answer that. Yeah, thank you for that though, because yeah, that there's, um, we live like in this world of like diet culture and fad diets and all of that, so um, that was, that's helpful, thank you, Rachel. All right, uh, Aaron, this question is for you. Is there, um, is there a such thing as a, an addictive personality? So this question is, I love this question. I get it a lot. Um, you know, I think the way I'm going to start answering this is just saying that in my experience, asking the question what's wrong with you rather than asking what happened to you um, is where things like addictive personality come from. Because it's when people say, oh, I just have an addictive personality um, or I'm addicted to food. I've heard that too, you know. I think the better question is, you know, what, what are the ways that you're, what are the things that you're covering up by engaging in this process? And so, I know in my experience of, you know, I started out in recovery from drugs and alcohol. Um, I quickly became very compulsive with other behaviors, including um, it activated an eating disorder in me. I was very much a workaholic. I was addicted to um, my title, the education I was getting, uh, the prestige I was getting. I was addicted to um, certain relationships with men, friendships with women, uh, codependency. I mean, I could, the list could go on and on. And so the question would be, well, does Aaron have an addictive personality? And when I think about the word personality, it means characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinct character. And when I think about my recovery process of uncovering the original core me that is my personality, I don't think that the core center of me is an addict. So 
I guess I would more reframe that if someone brought that up, do I have an addictive personality? I would get curious with them and, and just help them maybe uncouple who they think they are from this addictive self. Because I have found that just that attachment to that label or any label really beyond identifying the initial disruptive behavior, carrying that forward is often like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, like I, I say, I'm in recovery from the whack-a-mole disease. You know, I, I like to see it, think of it that way rather than, hey, I have an addictive personality. Because oftentimes in the same breath, when somebody says that, it's also, well, and this is why I can't do this. And this is why I can't do this, or this is why I do this. And so I find that that phrase can be problematic. And I usually meet it with compassion and curiosity and um, with the goal of reducing shame, maybe helping that person feel more empowered that they, they could maybe go to a casino and not become a gambling addict. They could maybe um, you know, eat sugar and not become addicted, that it's, it's not really about the things that they're doing. It's about what they're covering up and kind of get curious about how they're managing what they're covering up. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's great. Um, all right. So Dr. Kirby, how are process addictions viewed in the larger recovery community? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there is uh, some controversy about whether or not it is an addiction to be sexually um, or to be sexually addicted. There are uh, a group who just believe that it's a natural process and that the person should be able to conform their behavior to acceptable standards. Uh, when you work with people who, who life has been literally undone by process addiction, such as sex. Um, it, it's hard for me to see it that way. Um, definitely process addiction, addictions are harder to recognize because often the behavior that we're looking at is part of a life. Uh, nobody questions if you buy a lottery ticket or go to Tunica and gamble for a weekend. Nobody questions if you're single and you have more than one relationship or if you're polyamorous. So there's a lot of um, lack of physical symptom or physical presentation. Uh, and the person is, is very shame-based and very secretive about their behavior, uh, which, which can complicates it. And often they're lying and concealing and covering up what's going on with their life. Um, so that, that is one of the things that, that I see and that leads me to see sex addiction specifically is very problematic. I think we're on the verge of a pornography tsunami um, with younger and younger children having access to cell phones, smartphones, and being able to view um, pornography. Uh, we're seeing 18 year olds who are so addicted to pornography that while they're, when they do get in a relationship that they can't be physically intimate with their partner, which, which is very uh, difficult to start untangling and uh, you know trying to re rewire the brain. Um, you'll see people vacillate between high intensity, high risk sexual acting out and sexual anorexia, where it's just, uh, they'll just shut down at, in an attempt to try to eliminate and control the behavior. So um, another complication is that often with process addictions, you'll see an increased uh, vulnerability to substance addiction as well, so cross addictions. Uh, some research shows between, it's variable between 15 and 64%, but often in an effort to uh, cope with their shame and the, the, their feelings of um, you know, internalized hatred and loathing, they'll turn to a substance to, to cope with that. So, um, I think that people are becoming more open and more receptive. Uh, definitely when we start seeing people's families fall apart, their careers be jeopardized, uh, and we just see uh, their level of quality of life just plummet. Secondary term process addiction, it, it's hard to deny that it doesn't have 
the devastating effects that we see. Thank you, Dr. Kirby. You actually answered, um, I was gonna ask like if you've seen in, cause you have years of experience in this with um, a progression with access to um, like internet and things like that. And you, you've already spoke to that, that it's affecting children younger and younger. Yes. Um, impacting relationships and in and, and ways that, um, yeah, thank you so much. So, so, okay, when, when somebody asked me at what age should my child have a, have a smartphone, my response unfortunately has to be when do you want them to be vulnerable to pornography, which is really sad, but it's, it's the reality. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kirby for that. All right, so this question, Rachel, this is for you. Um, when it comes to overeating or any type of disorder eating, disordered eating, what does treatment look like and how does it differ? Um, what is, how is that different from substance abuse treatment? Yeah, so I think kind of just piggybacking off of my last kind of answer about how we don't know, you know, what people are dealing with. So I, I wanna start by saying, there are a lot of outpatient providers that specialize in relationship with food, you know, outpatient therapists and, and registered dietitians that specialize in disordered eating that can help people on an outpatient basis kind of start to understand food, understand how food maybe has been serving them in, in some other way besides fuel. I think a lot of people just simply don't understand how to fuel themselves. Um, so, that being said, there's lots of outpatient, you know, providers that can help. And if someone needs a higher level of care, there's lots of treatment options. I represent one called Sela House here in Nashville. Um, and treatment, like addiction treatment, requires a specialized team, you know, so a team with a registered dietitian, a therapist, a psychiatrist, ancillary therapies, group therapy. Um, it also includes meal support, and just lots and lots of education, um, understanding the why. So oftentimes there's trauma underneath there, similar to addiction, you know, treatment. And it's kind of like finding the roots of that, you know, the leaves are the behaviors and it's finding the roots of the tree. Um, so providing a safe place that people can feel comfortable to start talking about the why and talking with other people who understand, um, kind of like what Aaron said, I think it's important to disconnect from the diagnoses, like disconnect from the eating disorder. You know, I, I'm not an addiction, I'm not an eating disorder, and who am I um, outside of that? Um, and it's important to what we call legalize all foods. So there's no such thing as good or bad foods. And um, you know, sometimes that's reintroducing fear foods. Sometimes that's introducing binge foods in a, in a normalized way. Um, so just really getting comfortable with, with any and all foods um, because that helps with relapse prevention. You know, when people are done with treatment and they find themselves at a bowling alley and people order pizza and French fries, like what, how are you gonna deal with that? Um, and so really, you know, planning around situations around food, preparing for conversations around Thanksgiving when family brings up the keto diet or whatever, you know, cause we're inundated by those messages all day, every day. And so I guess in a way it's really, really similar to substance use treatment. However, the main difference that we all know is you can't abstain from food. So you have to face food, make food decisions and feed yourself multiple times a day, every single day for the rest of your life. And that's, that's the hard part um, about it. So, yeah. Well, and I'd like to open this question up to um, our other panelists as well. If you guys have any input on um, just the way that different process addictions are treated versus, um, you know, that of a substance abuse addiction. So um, just some ideas um, for those of us, you know, listening and learning today around maybe what um, relapse prevention looks like for gambling or for sex addiction or um, some of the treatment plan for some of the other um, process addictions that we're talking about today. If anyone wants to speak to that. Um, well, I'll, I'll just speak to it mostly because it hasn't explicitly come up yet, although I know we all know this and, and believe it, but 
Um, for me, once you're able to identify what is the behavior that is harming you and you're able to put some a contingency, a relapse prevention plan around it, my experience personally and professionally is that most people then have to address what is underneath that, whether that be depression, anxiety, complex PTSD, uh, PTSD, like a singular event, um, maybe sexual abuse or sexual assault, um, you know, coping with things that lead to dysregulation. Um, and so there definitely needs to be a, a period in my experience that is a little bit more boundaried around the behavior or around the substance or around the process. Um, like my, I have most experience with um, what would be termed love addiction, which I actually take that word off the table a lot of times with clients because so many of them so deeply want to experience love that that word can feel confusing and shaming. But, um, you know, that unmet longing, right? So if somebody has that compulsive behavior in that area, I might say, okay, well, why don't we take a break from dating? And why don't we take a break from these perpetual relationships and then um, kind of see what happens there and do that deep dive into, you know, what does it feel like when you walk into a room with people that you're attracted to? Like, what is that experience for you? And, um, you know, it, it's a really complicated answer, kind of like what Rachel said, but there's, there's a combo and it, and it takes time to kind of help. It's very individualized is what I, what I will say. I think that anytime there is a, hey, this is how you do it, it typically does not work with this type of stuff. I would say that's probably even true with substances, but I'll stay out of that. Um, but, but it's so complicated because what, the reason one person might be compulsively dating, it could be completely different as to why their friend is compulsively dating. And somebody else might have the same reason, but it might cause them to be love avoidant or it might cause them to you know, experiment with pornography. So everybody's relationship to that is so different and it, it really requires just a lot of individualized attention and care and support. So that, that's my answer. I'll let someone else speak. I agree, Erin. I, I think one of the things that I see people struggle with is what will my sexual sobriety look like? You know, because uh, much like eating, we, we don't tell people you can never do this thing again right? Because we live in sexual, sensual bodies and, and people want to discover if they've never experienced healthy sexuality, what is that? What is the difference? How do you become intimate, emotionally intimate with someone and begin to open up and trust? And of course, that's tied, as Aaron uh, noted, to their, you know, how, how, you know, what happened? Why did I uh, develop these issues? Um, so getting that underlying treatment developing a plan that makes sense for their life and meets their needs regarding safety and security. Um, especially if they're in a relationship, they're going to have to do a lot of work with a spouse or partner who is uh, suffering from betrayal trauma often. And so there's a lot of complexity to it. Essential through all of that is the, uh, the need for support and understanding and uh, going to groups, whether it's Celebrate Recovery, S-A-S-A-A, S-L-A-A, doesn't really matter. It's just find a group that you can relate to, who you can confide in, who you can be accountable to, and, and work your process of recovery. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is I think getting in your group normalizes what's going on, which erodes the shame some, and therefore you're no longer like in the quicksand of shame and you can start doing your work and it's just beautiful things happen when you realize, I mean, so I guess we're saying two things and, and I agree both, I, I agree with both of them with all three have said, you individualize treatment and you look for normalization simultaneously, which is a tricky process. But I feel like that kind of is in my many years of of this has taught is the thing that erodes shame the quickest is if they feel heard and individualized while simultaneously understanding that it happens to other people. So that's my thought on that. 
Yeah, these are, this is great feedback. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, what I, what I hear over and over is shame reduction, community, right? You need the community to recover, um, which, which is how you get um, that, that shame reduced, right? Because you connect and you see, I'm not alone. I'm not unique in this. This happens to other people. And finding that support group, like you said, Dr. Kirby, no matter what, what that looks like for recovery support, but finding that um, in a way that you can share transparently and openly and connect with others. Yeah, great feedback. Thank you all so much for that. All right, so this is for Lee. Um, why is it important to take process addiction seriously and treat them as a clinical condition? I think if you don't take them seriously, you're not treating the person and the individual. Um, so many times I think we wondered in the past, we wanted a one size fits all to help people specifically with substance abuse and our eating disorders. I think that they, it pops up more in those two. Um, and we didn't look at the cross addictions and then we wondered why people were, were, were failing at what we thought as clinicians um, would work. And you've got to look at the whole package and the whole person. I think so many times when you talk about cross addictions, you have to kind of look into the core issues that are causing these things, which Erin talked about, whether it's long-term PTSD, short-term depression, anxiety, whatever it might be, you got to dig in and do that work. Do that simultaneously to that. Um, most of these behaviors um, that are cross addiction go up before they go down frequently when you do trauma work and you have to be prepared to do that. Um, and I think it, it, we shouldn't, if people, if we don't address cross addictions, I think as treatment professionals, we need to no longer wonder why people aren't successful because it's very clear. It's just, it's that whack-a-mole game, right? I think Erin said she had diagnosed mm -hmm. with whack-a-mole-ish or something, I can't remember, but it was cute. I loved it. Um, but I mean, we're just constantly playing that game. And so we've got to address all of them. I think it's also interesting and I don't, oh, I think it was Erin too who said, you know, she came into this addiction space thinking she needed treatment for drug and alcohol and up came an eating disorder, you know, and up comes love addiction or whatever. And that's what happens with the people we have the privilege of serving. So if we don't address them, I said all of that, we're doing an, a, a disservice. And I've had people, because I've been a therapist for a long period of time, who've done really well, um, you know, uh, sober from substances and not acting out on their eating disorder. And 10 years later, all of a sudden, they have a cross addiction of love. Like, and we need to pay attention to that too and hold space for them to come back and do that work. Um, and I don't think it was missed in the beginning. I think life circumstances drove it in that direction. So we just need to be open with that, that too. Thank you. That is so good. Okay, so we will have um, a few minutes for questions here in just a moment, but um, what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes um, for each of you to talk about um, your programs, because we have some really great partners um, on this call today, um, all representing some great programs that do wonderful work. So, um, Rachel, you know, we'll start with you. If you can just give a summary of like what you all do um, in the services that are provided. We'll kind of go through and um, with each of the panelists and then we'll open it up for some questions with everyone. Sure, yeah. So like I said, um, so we have a newer, newer program to Nashville. So we recently opened up uh, Pasadena Villa, PHP IOP for primary mental health, as well as Sela House PHP IOP for primary eating disorders. Both treat 18 and up adults, all genders, and we're located on Vanderbilt University's campus. And as we were just speaking to, you know, the co-occurring things that could be going on with someone, we have that ability with our program, even though they're two separate programs, we are treating, you know, primary mental health, trauma, disordered eating, and we can intertwine any and all of those treatments as needed. We can also treat co-occurring substance use disorder as long as it's not their primary. So we'll, we'll be able to individualize care for these clients, however that, however that needs to be for them. Thank you, Rachel. 
And also just for everyone um, that has signed up, um, we we will have the panelists information as well um, that for this event, and it's also on our LinkedIn. So if, if you all wanna get in touch with any of our panelists today, um, we have promises and um, integrative life. We have them all tagged on LinkedIn as well. All right, Lee, will you tell us about BRC and the work done there? Helps when you unmute yourself. Um, absolutely. I am in the, the new executive director of NRC, which is the National Recovery Center. I actually am employed by BRC because they bought NRC out in the last 30 days. So it's been really confusing. Um, or maybe I'm just the one that's confused, but I am. Um, and basically we provide or we're working towards providing a continuum of care through detox, RTC, and then um, a step down unit, PHB, IOP, and then sober living. Um, so we really enjoy um, that. And we just started with RTC beds. I know recently we've had a couple of people, um, had somebody from Promises, we've had somebody from um, Integrative Life Center and Detox. And so we do that too. Like if y'all don't, you guys don't have Detox, we'll help them kind of separate from the substance, do what they need to do and send you guys back to them. But we also want to provide a continuum of care for people who come from outside the treatment community. Um, and I'm excited about doing it and learning Nashville. And as of like yesterday, I live here full time and not in a hotel with my dog. And I felt like I was, what's the little girl's name? Uh, Eloise in the books that lived in the hotel with her dog. Um, so I'm excited. Thank you all for letting me speak today. Thank you. So glad that you're able to be a part um, of this today with us. And NRC, you're like our neighbor right here at the next door. So right down the road. Um, okay, Erin, uh, if you'll tell us about Integrative Life. Yeah, so most people have heard of Integrative Life Center, so I'll start there. Um, we have been around for 10 plus years as a PHP and IOP with housing and also available to commuters. And in the last three or four years, we've expanded. We have three residential programs in Nashville. Um, two of them are that true ILC model that people think of, that trauma-focused primary mental health and primary substance abuse all mixed in to one beautiful bucket um, in a house. And then we also, uh, the newest residential program we have that some people may not know about is a primary intimacy disorders program for men only. Um, so it's a completely separate campus. And that ties into our other two programs. So the reason I'm Integrative Life Network is ILC has grown and we have two programs in Colorado uh, that specialize in 14 day intensive programs for men struggling with sex and porn addiction. Uh, those programs, men tend to be higher functioning, 25 years old and up. Um, often they're in trouble with their spouse or someone in their life and they're like, oh my God, what do I do? How do I stop this? And so those programs are available as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Erin. Okay, and Dr. Kirby. Thank you. The ranch has uh, been a staple in Nunley, Tennessee for many years. Um, we have uh, programming for men and women, mental health, dual diagnosis. We have a sexual recovery pre uh, program for males only right now. Um, we have a PHP located at the ranch where people from out of state can participate um, and, and stay at our facility. We also have opened a PATH, which is a Nashville-based PHP, uh, and we have a virtual IOP. So we've, got a, we've had a lot going on. Of course, this past weekend, we suffered quite a, a bit of damage, but everybody was safely evacuated. Um, our staff had just pulled together beautifully and really supported individuals. Our only loss of life was one of our horses cash. We're very, you know, traumatized by that. Uh, we are having a, a volunteer Sunday this week for the people who have been asking, you know, how they can help. And so that's referenced on our Facebook page. Um, and we're accepting new clients again. So we had, uh, you know, we had a couple of days of confusion, but uh, everything has worked out as well as you could hope for. So thank you for having me today. I really have enjoyed this. 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kirby. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is from Amra with Promises. Yeah, so um, she asked, is there a different type of support or therapy for family members of those that are suffering for, um, from process addictions? And I'm just gonna let any 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 of you uh, uh, panelists uh, answer that one. The range currently doesn't have a program, but that is a part of what we provide for spouses and partners of the individuals that come into treatment. There is a growing awareness of the need for specialists with regard to betrayal trauma, and so that is growing. I think you see more in the way of. Uh, three to five days intensives. Those are the kinds of experiences I'm hearing about. I haven't yet uh, learned of anything related to sex addiction uh, that's actually a residential for, for people who are uh, dealing with that in their family. Um, yeah, similar to uh, what Dr. Kirby just said, I Begin Again Institute does have a partner support program for the partners of the men that are currently in our program. So there's like a additional support. Um, and I do know specifically several therapists in Nashville that specialize in betrayal trauma. Um, I know I'm not as familiar, so I may not be the best person to speak of this, but the, you know, there's Al-Anon, uh, Families Anonymous, S-Anon, you know, those, those types of groups as well. Um, and then I also highly recommend that somebody whose loved one has, you know, is engaging in a process addiction, maybe get a coach or a therapist that specializes in boundaries, codependency, um, you know, maybe looking at what energetically is familiar about that, that maybe draw them, drew them to that relationship. A lot of people in my private practice are loved ones of people that have addictions and, um, often they'll be like, oh, that's where that comes from. It's like my dad, but instead of alcohol, it's this, you know, and so oftentimes that that can be very helpful to partners and family members. Uh, we have a family program that supports a whole lot of the cross addictions, but not specifically the betrayal. Um, because I think that work is best done individually, um, in my opinion, and y'all may totally disagree. Um, but the beauty is that if you learn to set boundaries and you learn how to work without, you know, within det uh, detaching and different things like that, it can be across the board. Um, and I think it would be really great as providers if y'all know of someone who is really good in Boise, Idaho, with supporting families that we build that provider network as we keep referring people out. I think that's important. I too know some really good people in Nashville and, and around the Southeast, but when you send people some other places, it's hard to do that, so. There's, there's also a family component of our program um, to help the loved ones, but also Renewed is a Nashville um, program for eating disorder support, and they offer a family support group for, for um, people who have loved ones that have eating disorder. I think it's currently on hold for COVID, but it's, that's a great resource for all things eating disorder support. And I'll just throw in one more thing really quickly. I, because I get a lot of those calls, I often refer not to I'm not going to sit here and do a promotion for all these other programs, but, you know, on-site, the Bridge to Recovery, um, PCS in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, there are several intensive type programs that are wonderful for those family members. Like if they are really deeply in it and they need to actually go somewhere um, and have the same level of support that their loved one feel free to call me because that's like my favorite kind of people to work with and I'm happy to help try and place them. Um, there's more than what I mentioned, but those are kind of three of my go-to places. Right, all strong programs. Oh, we have a question from Jamie Harper. <laughs> Come on, brother James. All right, here goes. 
Um, I agree with everything that has been said. The problem is there's a problem. The problem that I've come is that sex addiction and all this uh, is not diagnosable simply because it's not in the DSM. Um, it actually says in the DSM that groups of repetitive groups of repetitive behaviors, which some term behavioral addictions, with some subcategories of sexual addiction, exercise addiction, or shopping addiction, are not included because at this time there is insufficient peer-reviewed evidence to establish the diagnosis. Now, along with that, in the ICD-11, it is termed compulsive sexual behavior disorder. Now, with that being said, I work with a lot of individuals. I am an individual in recovery from sexual compulsion, sexual addiction. Uh, so I know that it is real. But in order to get someone into treatment and to allow insurance to cover it, it is very difficult next to impossible to do. A lot of times we have to send them out of state. A lot of times we, it's still difficult even then. We have to find just a group for them to be in whenever they need long-term care. Does anyone have any suggestions? Also, uh, I am. I just finished a master's program for clinical mental health counseling, I'm looking to get in to become a CSAT and work in EMDR with trauma. And we'll be looking to, you know, find a place to work pretty soon. So <laughs> call me. Call um, me. We're hiring. Call me. <laughs> You can call me. We're all we're all hiring. Call all of That's us. That's right. You can call me too. We're hiring <laughs> too. Thank you. Well, you Sh shameless, shameless plug. Sorry. So my my uh, initial response to that is we're hoping that the next DSM yeah. will have some of this in here based on the gaming addiction that they put in this last revision. Um, so hopefully they're. I mean, you know, it's kind of like. Um, we waited forever for them to put autism and all the different facets of that. So insurance would cover it within the DSM. So I'm hoping that at least that's being, I, I know that's being seen and being talked about. So that would be my initial response to, to that piece of it. But now I'm going to hide. Sure. And, and I seldom see anyone. I'm, in fact, I've never seen anyone come into our program who just has other sexual impulse. You know, there's Nine times out of 10, there's major depression, PTSD, anxiety, uh, substance, just, you know, it, I've never seen it just in isolation. So often that's what we have to work with insurance companies to help them understand how this altogether meets medical necessity. And it, and it can be a fight. I agree. Those peer reviews can be tough. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just comment to, you know, Integrative Life Network is completely out of network with all insurance. And part of it is because, I mean, I would burn the DSM-5 if I could. Now, I know that might be sacrilegious on here with so many clinicians, but I really would. And, um, you know, I did utilization review at a treatment center. So I know about those peer reviews and those fights and it is not logical and it is about money. And I don't want to get into a tangent about that, but um, what we find at uh, our men's intimacy disorders program is I have yet to find someone that doesn't have a diagnosis of another major mental health disorder such that we are able to utilize their out of network benefits. Um, I, I'm sure that it's even harder when you're trying to get in network authorization. Um, but it's also one of the reasons our program does a lot of, um, you know, discounting or, you know, at, I mean, these programs do cost money. At the same time, we understand the challenge that you're presenting and it, it's very upsetting. And it was a very upsetting in the community when the DSM-5 came out and it did not have that in there. Um, it was, yeah, because we all know it's real. So um, anyway, I'll stop as well before I start burning books. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Brother James. And um, Ben has a question regarding, are there places for men struggling with eating disorders? Yeah, yeah. Um, part, so our program here, Sela House, is going to treat all, is treating all genders. And we haven't had that option in Nashville for forever. 
Um, and I know when I was a practicing dietitian, I, I saw a lot of males with eating disorders. I saw a lot of transgender clients with eating disorders and I didn't have anywhere to send them. So our local program here specializes in all genders, males with eating disorders. And we also within our network have um, a residential eating disorder program called Toledo Center um, in Ohio. And they also treat all genders. So it's, it is kind of rare sometimes. A lot of programs specialize in female and females and it's unfortunate. And I think a lot of the eating disorder community still thinks that it's primarily, it's only a female issue and it, that's not the case at all. So there are options and I'm happy to be a resource. Yeah, and I'll also say, um, you know, Integrative Life Network and ILC doesn't promote itself as a primary eating disorder program. Um, but if somebody has an eating disorder as a part of their process, um, you know, we have um, a director of eating disorder programming who is an eating disorder specialist. We have registered dietitians on staff. Um, and, you know, when I attend treatment team as an outreach professional, they're always talking about the eating disorder and disordered eating behaviors. So, um, you know, most of the men actually struggle. We, we find it just as much in the men's house as we find it in the women's house. So um, yeah, for primary, I would not send to us, but if, if the eating disorder is, is showing up um, as the result of complex trauma or a substance use disorder, we can take um, those people within certain criteria. So let me know if I can help. Okay, well, to be mindful of everyone's time, um, I am gonna, I'm going to close this out again by thanking um, all of our panelists today. I feel like I've learned so much from all of you and just appreciate the work that you all do in the field um, and um, appreciate your time spending this last hour with us. And for all of, all of you who have joined us either on site or virtually, um, thank you again for just being a part of this discussion.